the prophet Isaiah lived in a time when apostasy and idolatry plagued the Holy Land. So we saw, or we can see in his work or in his book, his words shooting into the north, Israel in the north, and Judah in the south. This is an amazing book, Isaiah. What I intend to do today is, is really a summary, in essence, of the book itself. But it's one of those few books of the Old Testament that is so much prophecy in it, it's unbelievable. In fact, it's the longest book in the Old Testament as far as prophecy is concerned. So his warning message had a theme and that was God is going to destroy all the false gods and idols and he would eventually set up his everlasting kingdom. So it contains many Christological prophecies yes, the Old Testament and we see a lot of them fulfilled in the New Testament for example we see Isaiah 9 6 that it was fulfilled in Luke 2 11 Isaiah 56 50 chapter verse 6 as well fulfilled Matthew 26 67 Matthew 27 and so on so it's a very very I know um, Adrian, Brother Adrian is doing a study now on the book of Isaiah. It's available each Wednesday on our um, Facebook page, Canada Facebook page, as well as the Toronto Facebook page, where he goes into some more details regarding that. But Isaiah, this prophet, prophet or this book of the Bible that you know people just skim over because it's Old Testament, it is amazing how it fulfills in the New Testament because okay so Isaiah was his prophet his prophecies were aimed at at Israel in the north and Judah in the south at that time a lot of the prophecies were written for those nations but guess what as the books as the book develops we see the prophecy being extended to the entire universe and to the future as well so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna um, kind of touch on some of those today. Time won't allow me to go into all the details. So we see of popular importance is the, the description of the, the, the five aspects of, of crisis savings work that is it, it's intertwined into some of those prophecies. We see them appearing mainly in 52, Isaiah 52 and 53 and we normally read that at Passover time, you know, about the, the suffering servant and how he was wounded for transgressions and, and so on. We see all of those too. And then the book refers, first of all, it starts and it announces years ahead of time of the birth of Jesus Christ. Then it also goes into his earthly ministry. What he's going to do here, the redemptive work. And eventually talks about the, the, his death. And then this everlasting kingdom that is coming over the whole universe. And we read we, some of those chapters, we read them at just concluded Feast of Tabernacles go through so many of those scriptures so apart from Isaiah and Micah and uh, Zephaniah a few of those minor prophets we see the bulk of the the new the, the kingdom message contained in the book of Isaiah and it's no wonder a lot of churches don't have that grasp on the on the annual Sabbaths and the kingdom message why? Because it's an Old Testament prophecy. And we know those prophecies have not been fulfilled as yet. Even this day that we are meeting on is prophetic. Because we are going to see that a time is coming when all nations will have to appear before him on the Sabbath. So that was, has been completely missed by Christendom. So we're going to go 
into it and what I intend to bring out is the fact that this one who has been anointed by the Father is the one who is going to carry out and has been carrying out this, this uh, mission. So the prophet tells us of the birth of Messiah, Messiah from the Greek, Mashiach meaning anointed. That's what it really means, the Messiah, the anointed one. So Messiah in essence means, it can also mean prophet, priest, and so on, kings to a lesser extent. But what, what is amazing is that Okay, in ancient Israel, we know that prophets and priests that were anointed for special missions and so on. And what, does the, what this means is that a simple were set apart for special service. Basically, it's nothing much more than that. But scripture predicted a coming Messiah, an anointed one, set apart from all the other prophets, and so on, in a, like in a special category. Why? Because he was the son of God. Basically, that's what he was. So, in Acts 10, 37, we can read, That word, I say, you know, which was published throughout all Judea, and began from Galilee, after the baptism which John preached. Verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth. So the anointment, the anointment came from Yahweh. With the Holy Spirit and with power. Who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. So when we see now in Matthew, the angel announcing the birth of the Emmanuel, and what does that mean? God with us. So we see a literal fulfillment there. Isaiah 6 11 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek. This is Jesus Christ, it's referring to the Christ. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. So here, the Messiah is seen as the anointed deliverer. Not from earthly powers. 61, yes, yeah, sorry. 61, one, yeah. Oh, sorry. Getting mixed up here. Yeah, but from the, not from earthly powers, but from heavenly powers. So in Matthew 16, 16 again, from the New Testament perspective, we can see Simon Peter answered, You are the anointed one. You are the Messiah. The son of the living God. So, we can back up and we can... Go take a little peek now on the book itself. So the I Isaiah tells us, first of all in chapter 9 verse 6, that he would be born, this Messiah would be born, born of the house of David. Right? And he would tell us, unto us a child is going to be born. So the anointed one is going to be born unto a son unto us a son is given and the government the government a word that you hardly hear in the in the scriptures if you don't really you know knowledgeable about the kingdom message if you're knowledgeable about heaven message and going to heaven and so on you hear about that but government in the scriptures is talking about the rule of no other one than the anointed one. The government, the rule and peace of his government and rule and peace, there shall be no end. Not a term government, 
a government by term, there will be no end. And upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom, to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth even forevermore. So our message can be laced at all times with hope for people in this fallen world. That there is a kingdom that is coming, a kingdom of liberty and justice for all. No discrimination. For all. For all. And who is going to do it? The anointed one. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Yes, he's also called wonderful and counselor, mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. So, ch chapter 11 of Isaiah, verse 1, can, tell, can now tell us, and there shall come forth out of the rod of the stem of Jesse, a branch shall go out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. So we see a unique anointing here. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom, the Spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So many attributes here that have been placed on the anointed one. He lacks nothing. He lacks nothing. Verse 3, And shall make him of quick Understanding in the fear of the Lord, he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. So no more faulty judgments as we see here on our planet, where people get away with murder and all kind of sins. Lock them up today and they're out tomorrow. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth. A lot of things are going on that he will smite the earth with this rod of his mouth, with his power. And with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. A whole world that lies in wickedness. Where people live in fear and every day you get up to a different store. Whether it's not, whether, when it's not pipe bombing, it's letter bombing and all kind of ridiculous things. And what is not fake news and what is fake news. All the nonsense will stop. Because mm -hmm. he shall slay the wicked with his very breath. Amen. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins. You wish the Christmas story would come with things like this rather than just a little eating and drinking and merry making and drunking and committing sin and doing all kind of things in the name of God. This is announcing the birth of Christ and look what is coming with it that you don't hear. You look, it's here. I'm not making this up. Am I? No, it's here. But you know what? It's Old Testament, so we don't bother with Old Testament. We're the New Testament church of God. We don't need the Old. Righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. And so what is, what is he going to do with that? When he sets up all this government that shall be upon his shoulder of the order of Melchizedek and David and so on. So verse 6 now, that is, we, we just came back from this occasion that we, we mark it now. So we can, we can look forward now to this time when the fulfillment of this prophecy will come into reality. When the wolf shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. Verse 6, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together and a little child shall lead them. That is where the anointed one is leading you and I. So when this birth was announced, 
It was significant. I've said it before, it's just a pity we, we don't get too much into the birth because we don't want to be entangled with Christmas. But let's face the reality, the birth was announced. It's scriptural. Jesus Christ was born, not on December 25th. Doesn't have anything to do with Santa Claus and Christmas tree and eating unclean meat and drunkenness. But he was born for a purpose, a glorious purpose that we need to talk about and, you know, kind of come out of the shell about not wanting to talk about the birth. Maybe I should be talking about it in February, not so near to the time, but just one of those things. We should be able to talk about it any time. Any time. Because what? This birth will ensure that a time is coming when verse 9 says, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. We yearn for that time to come upon us, to come upon this, upon this sin sick world. Yes, what a glorious time this anointed one is paving for us, is paving for you and I so we can really live out the promises that he made to all of us. They shall not destroy in all my holy mountain for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In chapter 49, verse 1, the anointed one, the prophet tells us, would be a servant of the Most High God. Listen, O islands, unto me. For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. Wow. And he made his grave, not with the righteous, but with the wicked. He was, body was on the cross with all these thieves and the Barabbas who they said, give us the Barabbas. Give us back Barabbas. Yet, okay, sorry, sorry, because he had no violence. Neither was any deceit in his mouth. And verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. So Yahweh accepted what he was going through. And knew that he had to do that. For the sins of you and I. So it pleased him to bruise him. He has put him to grief. And the grief was so overwhelming that he offered a little prayer and said father if this is possible take this cup away from me the humanness was coming out of him there was put to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of Yahweh shall prosper in his hand. So the Heavenly Father took that as he expected he would. Because he realized that there is a mission for my only begotten son to come to this planet. He shall see, verse 11, of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by the knowledge, by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many. This is Old Testament, yes. I'm talking about Messiah, the anointed one, how he would die to justify many. How this suffering servant, this righteous servant, would die for he shall bear their iniquities and God's anointed did not resist he did not have a bone of resistance in him mm -hmm. he just accepted like a lamb brought to the slaughter and is one of those things I 
comment from time to time because I think last week when I was speaking I brought out that point and I usually reflect here because sometimes people would ask you know and I've had that question posed all the time why we don't go on the street and march against iniquities on this land and the, on the and the sin and the the you know what's going on in the country why we don't go and march take the pack cards and rather than sitting in a cool church like today and sitting comfortably in your chair and you know the place is warm and nice and cozy why you don't go on the street and tell march against the government and tell them what they're doing is wrong in the face of Yahweh why don't you do that I said that is not my role and I don't think this is the role of the church if you want to go and do it I won't stop you but why should I give me a good reason why should I because I believe the role of the church is to preach the message to be the voice in society preaching right so that people can distinguish between right and wrong but we can't change things and why should I want to change things anyway tell me you want your kingdom of God to come so why you want to why you want to stop things you want to stop the time we can't stop the time and if the anointed one said this have to happen who are you to try to stop it why would you want to stop it by the way I don't I keep telling people if I wake up tomorrow morning and it turns to start a war, nuclear war is ahead I'm, I'm the first to start dancing because I want the war to come because with the war that is coming my redemption is coming too didn't the Bible tells us of a time when all flesh, almost all flesh will be just distinguished from the earth? So why should we fear? It's time as God's people that we, we, we have these fears removed. And we pray and we come here all the time and we pray for thy kingdom to come. So what are you praying for? So what you, what you, what you think you want to stop what's going on out there? If you don't agree with it, we don't agree with it. And now we as the church and as the body of Christ, there are things we just don't agree with. So what? I say, lay it on me. Lay it on society. Because our joy is not of this world. Our joy, we are living in this world, but our joy is of the world to come. That's what Isaiah is trying to tell us. That is going to be accomplished by this anointed king who died for my sins and your sins. So I, I, I want to see that headline sooner or later. Nuclear war. Yes, come with it. So let us be brave. Let us not compromise the word of God just, to, you know, we want to live a nice life here. Yes, okay, live your life. But it's going to come a time when Life really is just a vapor, nothing. Life here today, gone tomorrow. So he did not resist. He was oppressed. He was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Wow. So Isaiah says, chapter 50, verse 5, The Lord Yahweh has opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. I gave my back to the smitters. Oh yeah, they spat on him. My cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. Imagine that. Imagine that. We don't see this in the movie. I've never seen a movie with talking about that. We saw the spitting. Right? I hid not my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore I shall not be confounded. Therefore have I set my face like a flint. Like a flint. Sparks. You can do anything with it. And I know I shall not be ashamed. Not be ashamed. But brethren... The Holy One of Israel, Yahweh, Yeshua, 
will be anointed eternally or has been anointed eternally. Chapter 53 verse 8. He is near that justifies me. He's always there. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is my enemy? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God will help me. Who is he that condemned me? They shall all wax old as a garment, and the moth shall eat them up. Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant, that walks in darkness and has no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. Amazing book. I will recommend when you have some time, go through this book step by step to see a lot of things that we just, you know, we just read over and we don't really take note. So the, the, the ultimate sacrifice would come. So he announces the birth. He announces the death. And with death comes life. With death comes life. Chapter 56, verse 6. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants, everyone that keeps, what? Is one of those prophets who talks a lot about the Sabbath. And it's perhaps one of the reasons to why this book is stayed away from. Because it talks about the Sabbath. Present and future. The future of the Sabbath. It talks about that. We'll come to that later. Everyone that keeps the Sabbath from polluting it and take hold of my covenant. Even them will I do what? I'm going to bring them into my kingdom, my holy mountain. Because holy mountain, that's the figurative um, language for, for my kingdom. <laughs> so, so when you do this, even them, I will bring into my kingdom and make them joyful in my house of prayer. So we are told to go to the Feast of Tabernacles and be joyful. We see the symbolism here coming out. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifice shall be accepted upon mine altar. Yes, in the millennium, the Bible talks about burnt offerings and sacrifices going to go, going to happen. We tend to think that would be for educational purposes, but not. For, we know there's no redemptive aspect of that. For mine house shall be called a house of prayer. So when the, when the anointed one now would go into the temple, in New Testament, and all the gamblers and all the money changers there, you know, doing their thing, he could turn over the tables in anger and say, listen, this it should be a house of prayer. So Isaiah was talking about that long ago. And Christ come and he, there was an incident where he had to shout out on that. Because his house was being taken or being used for another purpose. And he could claim that house, that temple, the future temple, because he is our future temple. The Lord God which gathers the outcasts of Israel, yes, yet I will gather others. I will gather others. So he's going to gather the outcasts of Israel and also others beside those that are gathered unto him. So we see again the extension to all nations and tribes and tongues will come into this full understanding of what it means for redemption, not only for Israel, but for everyone. Isaiah then gets, he was rather privileged, you could say. One of those prophets who got a glimpse of the throne of God. Not many. We see the visions of John and Daniel and so on. 
But this prophet, wow, he's been there, you could say, chapter 6, verse 1. He's been there. In the year that King Uzziah died, I, I saw the Lord God sitting upon a throne. Wow, he saw it. High and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. <coughs> Above it stood the seraphims. You can imagine a seraphim touch down in this room. It will be vacated within seconds. I think all of us would run. I would be the first. <laughs> because the countenance, the, the, the light that they would have here would blind all of us. It had six wings. Six wings. And with twain he covered his face. His feet. And with twain he did fly. Wow, that must have been really a magnificent creation of God. Isaiah saw it. He got the privilege and he saw it. And they cried unto another. And they said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The earth is not yet full of that glory. But in what he's seen here. Futuristic. That time is coming when the glory of the Lord will cover the whole earth. And this holy, holy, holy means a lot. When it was mentioned once in scripture, it means holy. But second and, th and then a third time, our mind cannot even imagine what these creatures are doing. It's their job to say holy, holy, holy. Because God is holy. And people have a nerve today, want to use, or want to wanna preach or pretend as if God, there's any, any little accommodation for sin. Can't be. Because God is too holy. Right, Sister Davina? It's too holy. It's too holy. And no wonder he has to send this anointed one, as much as he loved him, to send him to die. For you and I. It's no wonder. And so these beautiful creatures of God, they're just singing holy, holy, holy. Wow. And we read on into the chapter and we see uh, some amazing things going on. The post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried and the house was filled with smoke. I think smoke is not a right translation here. Because smoke makes you cough, right? So I think it's misty or, you know, something along the line. So I think this is wrong here. Not smoke. In God's realm, there's a, there's a beauty that words cannot... But the translator says smoke. But I think it's like misty and, you know... Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone. He said, oh Lord, I'm finished now. <laughs> Why me? Why am I seeing all of this? Because I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. So he's saying, no. You know, I'm, it's like society rubbing off on me. And here I'm taking up into God's glory. Hey, what's this about? But Isaiah, I think he mis un or he underrates what God was really the plans he had for him to tell the world of who he is and why and what he's going to do for us I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for mine eyes have seen the king the lord of hosts then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongues from off the altar. And he said, laid upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. So now I think he got the message. He got the message. 
I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here, are I, here am I, send me. Send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear you indeed, but understand not, and see you indeed, but perceive not. So Isaiah didn't even have a full understanding of what this is all about. He was the messenger. He was the messenger. Make the heart of this people fat. I don't mean, you don't mean that kind of fat we know of, right? And make their ears heavy. Shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart. And convert and be healed. And be healed. So, brethren, that it was a little tweak on that special opportunity that he had. And so he goes on, and I said, there's so much in this book, chapter 33, 17. After seeing all of, all of this, he admits, Then I shall see the king in his beauty. They shall behold the land that is very far off. So he now have a kind of understanding of what lies ahead. But brethren, all of that accomplished, the greater mission now is yet to be accomplished. Because we don't see King Jesus as yet. The glorified King Jesus. Because he is God's anointed, came, did what he had to do, and so now he's on his father's throne glorified waiting the countdown has started for the second part of his advent so he tells the prophet Isaiah verse chapter 13 verse 6 howl ye when you howl is not a whisper. It's not quite talk. <laughs> it's mean it comes from down here. Howl, warn. In some places say, blow the trumpet. Tell my people their sins, their transgressions. Spare not. Tell my people their sins. Because I'm coming. So prepare. Because John the Baptist is coming well. That was in the first Advent. So prepare the bride. Who is the bride? Prepare the bride for the groom. So how ye for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a nice time for everybody. So this is what now where we become deceived. Because we think it's a little timid king is a little lamb coming back and this is where the Christmas message screwed everybody when I say not um, skewed I should say it's skewed because it, it, you get the message of a little you know baby Jesus so you don't really think more than that but no it's not baby Jesus coming back it's not baby Jesus coming back it's, he's coming now as a conquering king. Conquering king with the rod of his anger is there in his mouth. He's going to even spew it out and, spew, and figuratively of course and slay the wicked. So it shall come as a destruction from the almighty. And, it's, it's, and the, the destruction will be so intense he says, therefore, verse 7, all hands shall be faint and every man's heart shall melt. When your heart melts, you're dead. When your heart fails, you're dead. So many men's hearts will fail. Matthew tells us that. And they shall be afraid pangs and sorrows remember we talk about the bird pangs the in 
intermittent pain when a woman is given birth goes away come back pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them they shall be in pain as a woman travails so Isaiah again explains what Matthew was telling us in Matthew 24 clearly it explains about these birth, birth pangs and these sorrows they shall be amazed one at another their faces shall be as flames in fire verse 9 behold the day of the Lord comes cruel both with wrath and fierce anger to lay the land desolate so the land is gonna be going through a, a kind of transformation because he shall destroy the sinners out of it so sinners those of you who think a little sin is going to enter in, that God is going to turn a blind eye to sin because he loves everybody. Yes, he loves everybody. But you have to change your lifestyle. You have to repent because that's a message. And surrender to King Jesus. Because the same idolatry that was facing like the Judah and Israel that he sent Isaiah to warn about is the same thing we're dealing with today. It hasn't changed. In fact, I think it has gotten worse. In this politically correct society, it has gotten absolutely worse. Mm -hmm. And he tells us now in verse 10, this sounds like the book of Revelation, but no, it's Isaiah. He says, for the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in its going forth and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. So when the sun is, being, is going through the heavens, it's not even shining. No moon, nothing. The constellations up there, you know, in, in, the, in the skies will not be shining. No Milky Way and so on. And I will punish the world for their evil. Not Israel alone or Judah. I will punish the world, the entire planet for their evil and the wicked for their lawlessness that's what iniquity mean and what is lawlessness when you break God's law when you break God's law that's what it is some people would say you know break God's will well, that is true too but let's be raw on it lawlessness when you break the law and I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease, to stop. So all the proud people out there with them arrogance, it's going to stop. And I will lay the haughtiness of the terrible. Wow. I think Isaiah addresses almost everything you can think of in our day and the implications we have. You go to the book and you see everything. In chapter 44, verse 6, he talks about... And again, saints of God, I'm warning you, you will have to stand up to defend Jesus Christ, the Anointed One. Mm -hmm. You will have to stand up to defend that name. Mm -hmm. At some point, if you live that long, or if all of us live that long, we have to do it. Mm -hmm. Because these warnings in Isaiah, they are given for a purpose. Is to prepare us and to strengthen us. So he says in chapter 6, Thus saith the Lord, King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And you can't say that without repercussions today. You can't. Somebody's going to criticize you and say, No. No, it can't be. Your God can't be true and everybody else false. There's something wrong with your brain, with your thinking, with your bigotry. Something is wrong with that. How oh, everybody's so nice and you're going to tell me about, you're going to tell me about your God being the only true God? Where did you get that from? It's here. That's where we get it from. Defenders of the faith, like the first martyrs. And who as I shall call, verse 7, and shall declare it and set it in order for me? You tell me. God is saying this now. Who? 
Who shall I call to declare it? Who is going to say? Who is going to go in society? Who is going to go on the internet and bravely say this? Who is going to go on television? No, you can't even go on television nowadays and say things like this. You get drop. You get reprimand for saying that. Because, you know, you have to be sensitive to other people's feelings. You know, you can't hurt other people. They're nice, sincere people. You can't criticize them. Let's all love one another in unity and, you know, let's keep the peace. That is the message, brethren. That is the message. And it's so important that there are certain rules out there now. And you flaunt those rules, you get stifled. Sometimes your funding can be cut off too. But Christ, the anointed, is asking, who is going to declare that I am the only true God? I can not call on Satan and his demons. I can not call on the people who don't accept me. So who else am I going to call to declare it? Who is going to set it in order for me since I appointed the ancient people? And the things that are coming shall come. Let them show unto them. But he says now, fear not. Verse 8. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Have I not told you from that time and have declared it? Haven't I been telling you that I am the only God? That everything else, I, everybody else I know, they're wrong? That Allah and Hindu and whatever is wrong. I am the only one. Get that in your mind. I am the only one. And I'm calling on you to declare it. He says it, you are even my witnesses. My witnesses. Is there a God beside me? No. There is no God. I know not any. None at all. And he pleads again in, in verse chapter 45, verse 5. I am Yahweh, and there's none else. There's no God beside me. I girded you, though thou hast not known me. Goes on again, chapter 46, so it's coming up. Remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there's none like me. The prophet is amazing. He has it all, everything. Because in the last days, he knew from God's revelation to him that it is coming back. Those things are coming back. What the ancient, what Judah and, and, um, and Israel went through, that is coming back in these last days. He reminds us again, chapter 54, verse 7, he says, for a small moment have I forsaken you, but with great mercies will I gather you. There will be our moments when we will tend to forget and compromise God's word. Happen to any strong lion, anybody who has strength like a lion. Happen to anyone. But God is merciful. In a little wrath, verse 8, I hid my face from you for a moment, but with everlasting kindness will I have mercy on you, saith the Lord your Redeemer. But he wants us, he wants us to spread this message before the return of the Anointed One. To spread this message, chapter 55 verse 6 again, repentance, Isaiah is talking about repentance, not an epistle from the New Testament, from Isaiah. From the Old Testament, he says, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon his name while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God for he will abundantly pardon. But if there's no repentance, if there is no repentance, especially for those whom he's calling, chapter 60, verse 12, 
for the nation and the kingdom that will not serve you they shall die they shall perish those nations shall be utterly wasted their time is coming so all of those great or those men who think they they own everything and they're so big and bold and can you know they can um, suppress people and oppress people the poor your waterloo is coming your waterloo is coming Isaiah is so thorough brethren Isaiah is so thorough 65 5 that he, he, he shows us that God is not leaving anything the anointed one is not leaving, leaning, leaving anything unturned. He's going to be thorough. Chapter 65, verse 3. A people that provokes me to anger continually to my face. <laughs> you know, I think that a lot of that is going on. They're just provoking God. The Holy One of Israel is coming in all stripes. From governments to people. They're just mocking and provoking God. I think that deserves a, a sermon by itself. It is terrible. So a people that provokes me to, to anger continually to my face that sacrifice in gardens and burn incense upon altars of brick, which remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments, which eat swine flesh, so even unclean meat. Even the pork eaters. The vengeance is coming on them. Yeah, not my words, it's here. Because they're provoking the Holy One of Israel. And he didn't say it once, he says, says it twice. Look at 66 verse 17. He said, they sanctify themselves and purify themselves in the gardens behind one tree in the midst, eating swine flesh, and the abomination and the mouse shall be consumed together, says the Lord. Even that. Yeah. But lobster and pork and everything is nice. But God said don't eat it. So when I come to establish purity on the earth. Because what? I am holy. And if I am holy. You have to be holy. And then if this is the temple of the living God. Your body here in the flesh. Then you should not be destroying it with unclean stuff. You should not be destroying it. So even that. Even that, I will take vengeance on him. So this God is very thorough. Chapter 65, as we draw to a close, now we see the promise coming into fulfillment with what his mission was about. And so on. And he says in chapter 17, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth. So again, we, we get a picture of what Revelation is saying, but this is Old Testament, not new. I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. But be glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. We're not talking about Jerusalem down there in the physical sense now. We're talking about the new Jerusalem that John pictured in Revelation 22. You can read about that. That's what we're talking about. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. For sure, brethren, there's weeping and mourning now. 
but all that is going to change because verse 25 tells us the wolf and the lamb shall feed together when when this government and this kingdom is established and their pain is gone and sorrow is gone so I didn't have to even come out of the book of Isaiah to tell you the hope that lies ahead in Jesus Christ it's all here it's encompassing all these prophecies and the lion shall eat like the bullock or eat straw like the bullock and dust shall be the serpent's meat they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain saith the Lord wow 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 yes chapter 15 verse 66 I mean chapter 66 verse 15 for behold the Lord will come with fire and with his chariots like a whirlwind to render his anger with fury and his rebuke with the flames of fire this is an amazing book because it clears and it paves the way for us here because we come here every Sabbath basically you know we won't be here this November 10 right <laughs> but we'll be somewhere else but we gather before him every Sabbath we come in the rain we come in the storm we come in the summer when it's nice we come in the winter when it's frozen we come here sometimes the room is warm sometimes it's cold but nevertheless you see it as a need to appear before God's throne of grace and you have a reason to do that so when I can read in verse 22 and this should be an inspiration for all of us not just only in this room but all God's people who gather on this day this should be your inspiration for as the new heavens and the new earth so we are projecting now into the future as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me said the Lord so shall your seed and your name remain and watch this it shall come to pass hasn't happened yet it shall come to pass it hasn't happened yet because the malls are full today and people do everything they want on this day but it's God's holy time this day is God's holy time but man through the influence of you know who has polluted it has polluted it and God said this is my holy day but guess what he says it shall come to pass from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath what one Sabbath to another shall all Jews come to worship before me said the Lord all flesh not all Jews all flesh shall come before me so in other words Yahweh the anointed one is saying yes this time is coming and he told, he told the prophet Isaiah that all nations will come to me on my holy day to worship him from one Sabbath to the next question if that is going to happen why are you not doing it now I rest my case brethren this is amazing find some time and go through this book it has everything about our future from the beginning to the end and beyond so I really was touched by I haven't even gone into some of the other stuff here but just came in the top here but when you want some real inspiration read this book because our hope lies here and especially we just came back from the Feast of Tabernacles where we celebrate what the kingdom is going to be like. Isaiah have much more to tell us about God's glorious kingdom.